The Columbia Broadcasting System presents The Free Company. For what avail the plow or sail or land or life if freedom fail? This is Burgess Meredith speaking from Hollywood. Last Sunday, I read a statement about the principles upon, upon which the free company was founded. Something about its membership and something about what it has accomplished. I want to repeat that statement today for the benefit of those in the radio audience who missed it last week. Some people have too little faith in America. Some people have been listening to harsh voices from across the seas, and the voices have been getting louder. Some people are just confused. It was to deal with this confusion in one way and one medium of expression that a group of writers and actors and Columbia itself formed the Free Company. The Free Company has the endorsement and cooperation of the Attorney General of the United States and the Solicitor General of the United States. The members of the Free Company have dedicated their talents to the proposition that we have in this country a way of life that is unique and precious and something to be infinitely proud of. It's the American way of life. In the spring of 1941, with all its flaws and all its problems, still the best way of life on earth. Who are some of the members of the Free Company? Well, there's James Boyd, chairman of the Free Company, an author of the series of American historical stories, Drums, Marching On, The Long Hunt, and Bitter Creek. He's a dollar-a-year man at the Department of Justice, and served as first lieutenant in the AEF at Samuel and Muse Argonne Offensives. Robert E. Sherwood, chairman of the Free Company Writers, is a Pulitzer Prize winner with a list of more than half a dozen stage successes to his credit, of which his latest is the anti-totalitarian play, There Shall Be No Night. He was a member of the famed Black Watch of the Canadian Expeditionary Forces. Then there are other eminent Americans, Paul Green, Archibald MacLeish, Stephen Vincent Benet, George M. Cohan, Mark Connolly, Norman Corwin, Ernest Hemingway, Elmer Rice, William Soroyan, Orson Welles, and many others. Columbia's vice president in charge of broadcasts, W.B. Lewis, is a member, and Columbia supplies the production, the music, some of the cast, and the time. All these individuals form a free company a company to interpret the true spirit of the Bill of Rights, the honest way, the American way of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now, today, Maxwell Anderson writes on freedom to worship God. Here, we take that freedom as a matter of course, but it can be lost, and the playwright shows us a nation where men not only may not worship God each in his own way, but where they may not worship any God at all except the state. We present Paul Muni in The Miracle of the Danube by Maxwell Anderson. Under the medieval towers of an ancient fortress on the banks of the Danube, a military trial is being held. German officers sit square and erect on tall hand-carved chairs about a long table. The officer in charge is General Merck, a veteran of the First World War. A major and several other subordinates sit with him to share the examination. The accused prisoner is Captain Cassell, now somewhat worn and worried. I declare this court martial in session. Captain Cassell. I have known you and your work for several years. You have been recommended to the higher command for acts of distinguished service and for devotion to our common cause. Nevertheless, as these officers know, there is no possibility of leniency toward those who have knowingly or even unwittingly abetted the enemies of our nation or our cause. We shall hear the charges against you in order. Lieutenant, read the accusations. In September 1938, three women prisoners assigned to the charge of Captain Cassell escaped during a transfer. This was held accidental and was passed over at the time, but is now recalled because of later occurrences. I allow you to speak in regard to that charge, Captain. Thank you, General Merrick. 
It is true. They escaped. You have nothing to say about the circumstances? I would have given my life to avoid any betrayal. We shall go into that later. Read the next charge. On February 10th, 1939, Captain Cassell was in command of the firing squads at the Moravian prison. Seven graves were dug at his order to accommodate the prisoners executed on that day. Only six of these graves were filled and no trace of the seventh body was found. This also was passed over as an error in the record. Do you wish to comment on this, Captain? Yes, General Merck. It was an error. Proceed. During the greater part of the years 1939 and 1940, Captain Cassell was employed, among others, in the work of transferring populations in Central Europe. This work necessitated occasional executions and the stranding of refugee groups within restricted territorial limits. Captain Cassell appeared to be an exemplary officer, eager to carry out the policies of the state. They knew him as the Reaper. His headquarters were known as Castle Blood. He was depended on more and more by his superiors. You will note, Captain, that we give you all possible credit. I tried to be a good soldier, General Matt. Continue. But there began to appear certain cracks and lesions in Captain Cassell's efficiency. Four religious leaders, determined enemies of the state, slipped through his hands into Sweden with a number of followers and were not recaptured. There was a riot at a concentration camp on the eastern border and the captain failed at a critical moment to give a necessary order to fire on the crowd. Later, he was entrusted with the liquidation of a large body of undesirables who had been collected at a southeastern boundary. These men and women escaped escaped in such fashion that Captain Cassell must be held responsible. It has been found necessary, therefore, to subject Captain Cassell to military trial. Captain Cassell, you are aware, no doubt, that these are capital charges. I ask you directly, were you remiss? Were any of these lapses intentional? No, sir. Then how do you explain them? I... I cannot. Come, sir, you're your own enemy. We're all friendly here. We do not intend to lose so valuable a servant from the ranks. Begin at the first rank. The uh, three women who escaped into Sweden... How did that happen? There were four of them. Three women and a man. In the records, there are only the three. Yes. The man joined them. Joined them? Where? In the camp. One of them was ill. He was taking care of her. He seemed to be a kind of doctor. But the escape? It was his doing. His only. But how? He spoke to me about the women. He spoke to me very strangely. For some reason, I I could not take my eyes from his face. He had a way of speaking at once passionately and slowly, so that you waited for his words. Come, what does this mean? Did he talk you into letting them go? No, I refused him. I laughed at him. I despised him. But the evidence shows that a cat had been overlooked on one of the doors and that the three disappeared into the night. Yes, that's true, but not because I was affected by what he said. Not because I connived at escape. I laughed at him, as I said, and turned him into the street. Locked up the women for the night. I looked personally at the lock on every door. Perhaps in my anger at this vagrant, I was not so careful as I should have been. He stood there talking and made me angry. But if there was an oversight, it was, I assure you, an intention. For the moment, I shall accept that explanation. Let us look next at the seven graves which were dug for those sentenced to be shot on December 9th at the Krug Fortress. Six men had been sentenced. Six Polish Jews convicted of sabotage while working on the great military road. Your records, however, showed that seven men were ordered before the firing squads. Seven graves were dug and that the orders for the seventh execution were cancelled at the last moment. On the face of it, this looks like an ivance of escape. It was the custom in the Krug Fortress to place those condemned to death in a common cell. I shut those six prisoners into the death cell after the trial. I saw to this personally. Then, as I turned away, I saw this seventh man with them. A seventh? Yes, Major. Who was it? It was the same man who had argued with me about the women on the night of their escape. How did he come there? I didn't know I came there, but he was there. I said to myself, this time, nothing shall go wrong. He's got himself somehow into the death cell with the condemned. Very well. Let him die with the others. I know I had no right to order an execution without the sanction of the court, but that man was my evil demon. He'd got me into trouble once, and he was trying again. Calmly, calmly, Captain. Very well. I ordered him shot. The prisoners were marched from their cells, and he came with the others. He stood up with the others before the squads. He went up and down among them, telling them to have courage. But when the firing was over, when they were shot down, 
He was not among them. His body wasn't there. Where was it? I don't know. I tell you, I don't know. What was this to be held against me? Would I have ordered him shot if I wanted him to escape? Calmly, calmly. I can't speak of him calmly. I, I'm sorry. You made an effort to locate this man? We made every effort, Major. The guards were questioned. The locks were examined. The civil and military authorities went over the ground inch by inch. They found nothing suspicious. Let us proceed to the next charge. In the summer of 1940, you were conducting a consignment of prisoners from the eastern border to a Baltic port. Among them were four Lutheran ministers who had banded together to resist the interpretation of Christianity, which is orthodox in the Third Reich. These four, with some 20 of their followers, escaped from the freight car in which they were being transported. This car was under your guard. The car caught fire, General Nutt. It was necessary to open the doors. In what fashion did the car catch fire? I, I cannot say how the fire originated, sir. This man who escaped at the time of the executions, did he have any part in the escape from the boxcar? Yes. Yes. He was there. What part did he take in the affair? I... It's difficult. Tell us the story of that escape. All of it? Yes, from the beginning. I will try. It will not be believed. However, I will try. You were in the car. I saw his face among the other prisoners in the car. I don't want... You. You! Stand up! Yes, sir. Come forward. How do you come to be among these prisoners? I came in with them. Do you know what prison they're bound for? Yes. Do you know the reputation of that prison? I do. Then that's what will happen to you, my friend. You've pushed in once too often where you're not wanted. First torture, then death. I'm accustomed to torture. And to death, too, I suppose. Yes, even to death. Who are you? Don't you remember? No. The picture in the silver frame. The reproduction of the Giotto that hung in your mother's room. The face in that picture. Surely it comes back to you now. What are you trying to tell me? The plainest, simplest truth. My face is the face in a picture by Giotto. Don't talk rot like that. Don't try to go me with some fantastic story. But this is not fantasy. My face is that face. My hands are those hands. My garments are the same. What do you mean? How could you be a man out of a picture? I see you before my eyes, and you're real. The others here have not seen me. See? They stare at you because you talk with the empty air. You lie! You lie? Trying to confuse me. To, to mislead me. Why are you here? You bring me here. You create me out of your mind. Out of your horror and regret for the blood you have spilled. For the man you were. You bring me here. Because you hate yourself and what you do. We shall see whether you're real. We shall see. I sealed the car doors together. I kept my automatic ready against an escape. Then there arose a cry among the prisoners. A housing had caught fire. Soon it was necessary to open the doors for air. Our car was the last on the train... And I therefore climbed to the roof and thence down the coupling which I loosed. When the car was free, I set the brakes and we came to a stop in the dark near a village. At the point of my automatic, I held the prisoners within the car while I ran to look at the housing. 
Then I saw that I had somehow been fooled. There was no fire. I turned to the car door in a rage, and the prisoners began pouring out. That painted face in the lead. I emptied my gun at him, point blank. And he did not fall. I swear to you, gentlemen. I swear to you, gentlemen. Within three paces, I fired ten times at his heart without effect. For he stood there and spoke to me still. The other prisoners made off in the dark... And then he, too, was gone. And I found myself beside the empty car in the night. And you expect us to believe that? No, gentlemen, I do not expect you to believe it. I wake in the night and say to myself that it cannot be true. That I'm a respectable officer, that I'm sane. That I live in a sane world where these things cannot happen. There are no ghosts, no shadows, no things like men that will not fall when you shoot them through. I know that. Yet, this happened, as I've told it. Did you ever see this man again, this uh, figure out of the Giotto painting? Not for several months. In justice to the captain, perhaps I shall tell you of his conduct after this episode of the boxcar. He came to the general staff with a request that he be put under some rigorous mental and physical discipline. He was sent to an academy in the Black Forest and there underwent a course in their Spartan regime. Here there is iron control, long hours of labor and instruction, no comforts, cold water, a Lacedaemonian diet. After six weeks, Captain Cassell emerged from this training, a new man. He was placed in charge of the liquidation of a certain province. He became known at this time as the Grim Reaper. The faltering which had marked his previous actions had disappeared. He showed no aversion to violence or the shedding of blood. For nearly a year, he led the way among the military protectors of that region. There was talk of making him governor general of the whole Polish area. What was the nature of your work at this time, Captain Cassell? I was in charge of the extermination of the intelligent. All leaders of thinkers, all writers or artists, all who stood out in any way were arrested and in some fashion eliminated. Did you feel any reluctance in carrying out this work? None! It's not the business of a German officer to feel reluctance. It is his business to obey. Moreover, I'm convinced and was convinced then that it is essential to the welfare of our master nation that we make slaves of our inferiors. An acceptance of slavery is only possible among those who cannot think for themselves and who have no leaders. It was my duty for the good of our country to eliminate the leadership among the subject people. You never softened your blows, never drew back your hand, never allowed yourself to be overcome by pity? Never! If only because I had made errors in the past, I determined never to slip again. I'd learned my lesson. Time was gone when a face out of a cheap reproduction would come between me and those who were condemned. Do you mean that this face still haunted you? At times. At times. Faintly. But I refused to see it. I drew a curtain of blood between that face and me. And then it ceased to appear. And I was free to do my work. Then this last occurrence, this last charge against you, the freeing of the boatload of prisoners on the Romanian frontier, how do you account for that? I don't know. I don't know. You understand that we must make these inquiries, Captain. Tell us what happened on the river steamer on the Danube. I've conducted 200 prisoners on, the board, on board the steamer of Constanta. There were 20 guards. My instructions were to land the prisoners on a small island near the Romanian frontier, execute the able-bodied among them, and abandon the others without supplies. We arrived at a point near that island at night, on the 6th of last November. Since we were unable to locate the channel in the dark, it was necessary to wait till dawn before landing the prisoners. They slept on deck, men, women, and children. Half of the guards went below deck to sleep, and the others remained on duty. I was awake and on deck. I stood looking at the black water of the river. Then the moon rose. And I could see an outline of the river banks a mile or so away. As I looked toward that shore, a man came walking out from it. Captain Cassell, there was a mile of water, you say, between you and the shore. Yes. Then I don't follow you. 
This man came walking across the water. Is it profitable to listen further, General Merck? We must hear him out. Go on, Captain. He came walking across the water. Very slowly. It must have been half an hour before he came near enough so that we could see his face. When you saw it, what face was it? The face of the Giotto Christ. Your phantom, my dear Captain, your phantom. No. This time he was not a phantom. How do you know? Because the prisoners saw him. They woke each other and watched him as he came. Such proof is hardly acceptable. Also, I had set the guards at the rail to keep him off the boat, but now the guards were phantoms. And he stepped through them as if they weren't there. He was real. And they were specters. With the moon shining through them. I think you confuse the matter, Captain. The men of the guard were flesh and blood. This ghostly figure passed through their ranks because he was a shadow. A memory of a painted face. No, he. He was real. And the guard was made up of shadows. He was real among them. As he's real among you now. Is he among us now? You don't see him. I do not. There. Behind you. Where the light falls. You see no one there? Nothing, Captain. Why have you come here? Was I ever with you when you had not called for me? I've never called for you. I've drenched myself in blood to be rid of you. I fill the air with screams and covered half the earth to be rid of you. Would it be possible to declare him of unsound mind? We can hardly escape the issue of guilt or innocence. And if he is guilty? The guilty must be punished. Very well. What happened, Captain, after this man came across the water to your ship? He came through the soldiers. They had become... Like air. Unreal. They could not stop him. Then this thing came over me. That I'd felt before. What thing? I was glad that he had come. In some horrible way, I was glad that I couldn't hurt him. Glad that he would conquer. That I would betray my rank and my orders. In some horrible way, it didn't matter, for he, he had become real, and he and I were real together in a country of ghosts. He and I and the band of prisoners were real, but the soldiers and the nation that lay behind them were unreal. The armies, the men of the government, the men of the secret police, all the forces of our nation were shadows that could not stop a wind. There was only one reality. This man and I, on the dark river and the group of prisoners sent there to die. And what came of this? I don't know. I think I must have let them go. You mean you allowed the prisoners to escape? Yes. You knew that this was an action deserving of death? It seemed not to matter. I think we need take no further testimony. To my mind, Captain Cassell is guilty and his usefulness is at an end. Is there any dissent? None, General Merck. Then the lieutenant will record the sentence. Captain Cassell, you have received an impartial trial at the hands of your brother officers, and it is my unpleasant duty to inform you that there is only one military consequence to your action. You two are shadows. You of this court. Be quiet, sir. You're all shadows. Ghostly folk about a table in a city of ghosts. The chairs and walls show through your forms. Your voice has come from a distance. Echoes of men. You will face a firing squad in the prison yard in the morning. And they too will be shadows. Why should I fear them? Or any among this nation of specters? I know now that I'm free of you. He and I sit together here. And we are real. In the midst of a cackling assemblage of shadows. Because... Go and leave me. I know what you think, insofar as you think, insofar as you exist at all. My mind is clear, and I know what I was never sure of. You're evil as you're empty. 
And my happiness is here, in the face of this one reality, this one friend who says that I did well when I did a kindness, that I was worthiest when I could not kill. Now that I've said these things, they'll make an end of me. They will put me to death out of their world. They put me to death long ago. I must face the firing squad in the morning. Will you stay with me then? Yes. I will stay with you. And in the night. <laughs> if I'm alone, my mind will torture me. Will you stay with me in the night? Yes. I will stay. Will you say again the words you said on the bank of the Danube? No man can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. And the rest? Yes. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they that do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. This way, Captain. Yes. I am ready. So Captain Cassell went to his death because his inner spirit would not be denied. That death was one of triumph and of comfort. He had found again his true belief, had made his peace with God. The freedom of every man and every woman to find that peace is, of all freedoms, the most fundamental, precious, and profound. And the powers of darkness know that well, and that is why, when they would enslave mankind, they strike first at the freedom of the soul. Faced with this threat in other lands, let us renew our resolve that this nation, under God, shall have a new birth of freedom, that government of the people, by the people, and for the people shall not perish from the earth. Paul Muni and Maxwell Anderson joined the free company under the chairmanship of James Boyd in contributing their services without payment. Leith Stevens composed and conducted an original musical score. The Free Company producer is Charles Vander. To the Screen Actors Guild, to the American Federation of Radio Artists, and to the Columbia Network, all of whom have combined to make this series possible. To all these people, with a word of a special thanks to Irving Reese, who directed, this is Burgess Meredith offering the sincere thanks of the Free Company. A copy of today's broadcast by Maxwell Anderson has been printed for distribution to listeners. For ten cents, the cost of printing and mailing, you may receive your copy. Write to the Free Company in care of the Columbia Broadcasting System in New York. A complete collection of the Free Company plays will be available in book form at your local bookstore on Monday, May 5th. Next Sunday, as previously announced, we broadcast the final program in the first cycle of Free Company plays called Above Suspicion. It was adapted from an outline prepared for the Free Company by the late Sherwood Anderson and stars Paul Lucas. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs> <laughs>